Lucy Harwood. Um, so I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat feet. <laughs> Phil Rice. This is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine. Use the machinima, Luke. Hello, machinima fans. This is, and now for something in completely machinima. We're doing our fifth season. Very happy to be here with my friends, Phil Rice, Damian Valentine, and Tracy Harwood. Uh, this week, we'll be looking at a film pick that I made. And I'm really happy to uh, share it with you. I've been, uh, as I usually go around the internet looking for interesting films, I happen to, as it as it happens, you know how it is when you're when you're surfing the internet, something leads you to one thing, and some another thing leads you to another place. And I ended up at the archive.org. Now, archive.org has got a lot of bad press recently. And, you know, the opinions are divided on it because they had books that uh, were complete uh, copies of books and uh, they were making them available for rent. Well, the publishers got upset about that, sued them and won the lawsuit. Um, so the bad press for that part of it might be deserved. We don't know. But they do many, many other things that are great for the community. Wayback Machine is terrific. But one of the things they have, which I really, really like, is their Machinima Movie Archive. It was started in 2004 by Henry, Henry Lowood. Wood. The name of the archive is They Got Game uh, Project. It's part of the Stanford Humanities Lab. And it's a, an effort to archive Machinima in order to further academic study. Um, of course, they'd have to use the word academic because it's a university, but I think it's more than just academic. It's an archive for people who want to watch great films and want to see what the history is. Now, originally, I thought that the archive contained mostly classic machinima. Now, I call classic machinima the machinima that was made before the big uh, changeover at machinima.com. And then after that, I call it modern machinima. It's just my way of uh, breaking it down. But no, it actually starts, uh, let's see, it goes from 1996 to 2023 was the most recent one that was added to it. It has, uh, let's see, 2,787 films in the archive, which I think is just extraordinary. Um, I did some research to find out other archives on the internet, obviously YouTube, has quite a few of them, but there's no real effort to to organize them with any sense of quality to them. I think this is probably the best one on the internet, and uh, we'll be sure to include a link to it uh, in our show notes. But uh, that's all preface to my choice. As I was going through the uh, uh, list, I found a film that I remembered coming out in... 2004. It was called Fake Science. And it was created by, in a week, by a company called Dead on Q. Um, let's see the guys involved in it. Michael Holocaust and ben, Brian Mayberry did most of the post-production on it. And they made it in a week. It won the Best uh, Visual Design at the 2002 Machinima Film Festival. And I thought, well, hell, I'll just give it a rewatch. And I just fell in love with it again. I, it consists essentially of six scenes. They call it an avant-garde film, but I'm not so sure avant-garde is the right word for it. It was created in the original Half-Life engine, and it consists of uh, six scenes in which the camera starts at a, folks, a point and then continuously pulls back to reveal more information. And then uh, there's a, uh, a crossfade, and then it starts at another position and continues to pull back. Eventually, towards the end of the film, you pull back in a very, very wide shot to see these sort of unusual abstract uh, buildings. Scientists play a big part of it. Essentially, the theme is uh, science has created television 
which is the scourge of humanity. That's sort of the theme of it. It's not a particularly original theme, but it's a relevant theme for modern day. But the thing is, the uh, music is, uh, let's see, They Went by Kiernan 54. Is The music is part, is 50% of what makes the, because it's sort of ambient electronic, and it adds this sort of science fiction-y feel to the whole thing. The overall effect is both comic and serious, too, because it's quite, like I said, the theme is anti-technology in a way, which is ironic since they're using a form of technology to actually express what they're trying to say. But I was just fascinated with it and loved it. I remember being very impressed with it because it was completely unlike any other film that was coming out at the time, which were mostly realistic efforts to to recreate stories, either that they uh, back back plots in games or uh, recreating uh, favorite movies or favorite television scenes or television shows. Uh, Red versus Blue being a prime example of that. But, and it wasn't as popular as Red versus Blue, but it, it had an impact on the machinima community at the time in that it showed that you could create something different if you just worked at it. It was probably somewhat hard to set up all the models and set up the camera position. I can understand why they chose one particular shot because it would be easier to create the camera effect at that time. And I have a theory, which Damien shot down before we started the podcast, but I have a theory that the the pullback, in effect, is in film, it provides the ability to reveal things on the side, but it also moves away from it. And it's a sense of moving away from something that is dangerous or something that is threatening. Whereas a push-in shot move towards something that is more, you get more information from, you, you're interested in it, it's secure, it's safe to move in on it. So in a way that shot actually fits with the theme because you're pulling away from this dangerous technology, this dangerous thing that's occurring, you're getting away from it. At least that's my theory on the whole thing. I loved it and I'm going to dedicate myself for the next several months to exploring the archive. So my choices will be uh, films from the archive going to ahead. Uh, you guys cover the modern stuff pretty well. So I thought it might be good to look back. So that's my take on it. And I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say. I'm very glad you reminded <laughs> reminded us of this, uh, this film, Ricky, because I remember it from when it, it came out as well and being uh, wowed by it and some of the effect of this film it's very easy to take for granted how comparatively easy it is to do effects like this with modern tools um, for them to have pulled this off when they did and there's little to no post-production involved with this all the effects uh, which it the end result is something that looks strikingly different from what half the Half-Life engine would spit out of its own accord. Um, so there was a lot of work to, to get the engine itself to spit this out, essentially. Um, so it's a, it's a remarkable uh, technical achievement, achievement yeah. for it, technical achievement for its time. And uh, yeah, it's an effective message. I think in that it's not terribly on the nose or insistent there there is a an openness to have different interpretations of it and i think that's one of the beauties of it yeah um so yeah i these uh dead on cue um they maybe don't get they haven't over the years on this show gotten as much mention as some of the other machinima pioneers uh but uh Brian and uh, I can't remember now his his cohort's name, but uh, yeah, they Mike. were Mike. they were very innovative, and and they didn't release a large quantity of things because they I kind of put them in the same category as like Friedrich Kirschner from that time, 
that he might not have been the most prolific in terms of quantity of releases, but every one was this exquisitely crafted thing. And I think that's the that's the approach that they took was we're not just going to crank stuff out. We, you know, there's there's going to be a lot of meaning and a lot of depth and a lot of and something innovative. There was a lot of pressure back then. I don't mean negative pressure, but um, there was a you know there was a space race of sorts, but it wasn't uh, for the kinds of things that we might find machinima makers chasing today for you know for comparison there was yeah. very much a focus on uh innovation uh because this this was all very new and it was a it was a pretty exclusive group of people who had the skills to be able to do this kind of thing back then um and uh the kinds of things that that filmmaking teams like dead on cue did uh, frankly make me a little bit embarrassed of what i did you know i mean and i'm not being like down on myself about it or anything but it's just it i mean that as the highest form of compliment that um there was a real skill set and a determination to figure things out that i don't know that that's lost today but it's it's not it's not the main thing people focus on nowadays you know and uh, i think maybe because some of these problems of how to do things have been solved by the work these guys did you know so now there's there's not as much reason to worry about that probably the same is true if we're using the space race analogy the same is true for you know the the you know the spacex is working on issues related to space travel and whatnot, but they don't have to redo everything that the Apollo programs did, right? Right. They're right. building on that. These guys were the Apollo astronauts of Machinima. And uh they they were taking real chances and uh and and doing things that again, it's really easy to look at this and go, well that doesn't seem like it'd be that hard to make. Uh, you know, <laughs> try tying both your hands behind your back and then doing it, yeah. you know, that's yeah, what exactly. they were dealing with. So, yeah. um, I'm really glad this is not a movie that I had thought about in quite a while, maybe just because it's not in my face or whatever. And this kind of came along well before we did the Machiniplex effort where we were kind of trying our own hand at, at archiving some of the great works. And I don't think that this one ended up in that collection, but it would have fit right in. Sure would those films for sure. Yeah. Um, it's it's a wonderful piece. So I'm really glad you thank you. It. Really marvelous analogy to the Apollo program. That's great. One thing that I think uh, can be said is that there's uh, there's something to be said for limitations for an artist. Uh, I remember there was a brilliant set designer at my university, and we had a WPA made theater that had no what they call the fly system above mm -hmm. the stage where you could drop stuff in. You could only hand carry things in and no mechanicals or anything. And I, and this guy was a Yale trained designer and he was brilliant. And I remember in taking his class, I asked him, I said, well, how, how can you work in such an awful theater? And he says, because I really like the limitations. It mm -hmm. challenges me to come up with creative ways to solve the limitations problem. And I think you could say the same thing for early machinima filmmakers. It's hard to create some of those shots, but the but finally getting them right is such a great pleasure when you work out the technology. Today, as you say, it's much easier to set up a camera and do a pullback shot. That's what, five, 10 minutes? Now it may have taken them a couple of days to get it right in those days. So, I, I think there's something to be said for limitations, and I think they, Dead on Cue, really faced it with great creativity and great energy and great thought, too. There's a lot of thought that went into the film. Yeah, um, I want to add on to what Phil said about the technical side of things, because I was watching it, and there's that scene where it pulls back down along a city street, and the windows are flashing in time to the beats of the music. Yeah, yes, that yes. really jumped out to me, too, yeah. Damien. And I was thinking, well, that must have taken a while to tight line it up. And then I started thinking about the games of the era. I thought, wait a minute, did they even have animated textures when they made the actual game? Because that must have been really tricky to pull off. And I started thinking about, you know, yeah, that, that's a huge amount of work. Even doing it now, 
getting the timing right would be tricky. But then you start thinking about the limitations. But yeah, that is very impressive. Um, so a few things like that did stand out to me. I have to admit, this film got released just about a year before I got into Machinima, so I completely missed it. So this is the first, my first time watching oh, it. Oh, wow. So uh, I want to thank you, Ricky, for introducing me to it, because I was very impressed by it, especially once I had that realization of, yeah, they put a lot of technical work into this that you just don't even think about now. Or if you do think about it, you're not thinking about it in that kind of level, because, you know, you can animate textures, games do that, and iClone can do it, and, 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 you know, any modern game or platform can animate textures quite easily. You still have to put some yeah. work into getting the timing right, but... right. It's possible. Um, yeah. Uh, it's really hard to follow up on that, but that's one thing that really stood out to me. Uh, and the other thing... Me, was... I'll, I'll add something to that real quick before you move on. The yeah. From what I remember of animated textures of the time, because they were there in like Quake 2 as well, but it, the, the closest thing I can think of to explaining how they worked would be how GIF images work, if you know what mm. those are. Mm. On the web, it's a fixed frame rate, very, you know, basic resolution. And it just, it, and then you can put that texture on the web and it will animate. You don't see them used very often nowadays because with high bandwidth, people could do all sorts of other animations with with style sheets and, and scripting and things like that. But in the early days of the web, that was the way you animated the texture was it, it was a, a CompuServe format, I believe is what mm -hmm. originally came up with the GIF image. Mm. Um, and there was something similar to that that was in this era of games. Um, and it was, it was very, uh, fiddly to work with. And, uh, yeah, it, it took some know-how again, you, you can go right now. You could Google in five seconds and find a site where you can just build a GIF in a few minutes, you know, right. That was not there then. Um, so yeah, it's, it's little things like that, that again, they look easy now, man, they weren't then. Yeah. The other thing is as you're pulling back every so often, there's some code numbers up here. I thought it looked like binary, but then there's some other numbers in there as well. I actually paused it and tried to see if there was actually a secret message in some of those. And I don't think I got it quite right because it's coming up with, um, ASCII character that didn't really make any sense, but I thought. Maybe I need to give that another go just in case I haven't got mm -hmm. this right and there really is a secret message in there because I like that kind of stuff. And if they actually yeah. have hidden something in there and no one's actually noticed until now, uh, I was quite I quite like that idea. So I'm going to have to go back and check that out. But Let yeah, us know whether you, you figure it out. Yeah. I'm not sure that, that there is actually, Damien. I didn't. Uh. <laughs> okay, so I've got a little more background on this one. Um, from uh, Actually, from... From the time when Ben and I were writing uh, the Pioneers book, um, we interviewed um, Brian Buddy Maybury, um, and I've got some information from that, but also a little bit more on the background of the film as well. They formed the studio, so Mike Keglinek was his handle in the community, oh. and Brian Buddy Maybury, and they, they formed their studio in 2000. And actually, as I understand it, this film was made using the Spirit of Half-Life mod add-on. And I believe you needed to have that mod installed before you could play the film. Um, even with a DivX player, although quite why that would be the case, I'm not really sure. But that's that's my understanding. And then within their studio, there were other folks involved. Um, Ricky, you've already mentioned Daniel Kirian 54 O'Neill, who was their lead audio engineer, and he's the guy that wrote the music for the film, which was called, I think, they, did you say they won't, or they weren't, or they? They weren't. weren't. They won't. They won't. It's they won't. They weren't. They won't. They won't. won't. That's right. Excuse yeah, me. Yeah, that's right. Also, Jenny Boo, Holo Holocaust was uh, the lead camera operator. And then somebody called Brian Lego Man Thomas um, was also one of the Dead on Q team. And as was somebody called Glyn Whirlpool Seal, who was the lead modeler. So there were a few of them involved with it, although I believe it was just Mike and Brian, primarily on the, on the, on the creative side of this particular film. 
you've already said it won best visual design at the 2002 Machinima Festival. Um, and that award was presented to them by Tim Willips of id Software. Um, and it was also nominated for best sound design and best technical achievement, although it didn't win in those categories. It's wor worth commenting here that this was actually the first iteration of the Machinima Film Festival that took place. And it mm. took, took place at QuakeCon. And it was actually produced by Anna Kang, um, who, who was um, the, direct, uh, the, the producer, of whatever, the director of Fountainhead Entertainment, which was kind of indelibly tied to id Software at the time because she was married to John Carmack for, mm. for years, mm. as you probably know. Um, and, and this event was also sponsored by NVIDIA, um, who were keenly interested in machinima in those very early days. And at that same event, Epic Games unveiled its matinee toolset for Unreal Tournament 2004. And also Fountainhead released Machinimation, um, which it was using uh, in the development of a, of a really big film that it uh, attempted to make, which ultimately it never really, um, I don't think it ever finished the film and I don't think the tool Machinimation ever really took off either. Um, but what was particularly important about that event was that it was covered by CNN, um, the, the Dallas Observer, the New York Times and what have you, and and basically was a, a sort of a key inflection point in the history of machinima. And this particular film was one of the key ones that was referenced. These guys were interviewed for many of the news stories that went that, that went around out of that particular film festival. Um, they then released another, so that would be in the September, I think, of 2002. They then released another version of it um, a few weeks later in November, which they said was an improved version of it, and it was called Fake Science Remix. Um, and, I, and I think that was to just do, to, to do with the, the, the smoothness of the animation. And I'm not sure which version of it is in the archive, um, because it's it's the same film, I believe, but just one has slightly improved graphic quality, I believe. Um, and then a year later, in November 2003, they released a, a dem version of the film, which could be played inside Half-Life itself. So there were three separate versions of this film. Um, and like you said, it was a, it was a, a strange kind of... Uh, you know, s story about TV taking over the world, I guess, in some way, an all-powerful television which which destroys the world, but the spirit of man lives on. Well, I didn't really get that through that film, if I'm honest. It kind of had a bit of a 70s vibe um, to it for me somehow. Um, I suppose the thing to say is it clearly, you know, it, it predates YouTube by, what, three years? Um would the subject matter of that sort of period of time, the fact that it was TV, would that be sort of a relevant inflection point at, at that period of time rather than, the, you know, the current, uh, you know, dominance of AIs and robots and all that kind of thing that we get th um, played through various films. So it's kind of an interesting subject matter, I think. Mm -hmm. Then when Ben and I were writing the book, we were lucky enough to get a chance to, to talk to Brian. Um, uh, and in that interview, he explained uh, how they got on board with Machinima.com, um, which they said was almost at the very beginning. They found um, the website Machinima and Hugh, I would I would imagine, through Brian's um, Google Food Training, um, which was sometime in the early 2000s. And then he said he and Mike were best friends in high school. Um, and they were passionate about games and they were developing this mod for Half-Life, which they said had included an overly elaborate story. Um, and as they were developing the mod, um, they figured out that there was much more to be interested in. Um, it, it, they were much more interested in telling stories through cinema than they were in actually playing the game. Um, and, and from there, what they started to do was use the old world craft, um, Valve Hammer editor to make a movie um, and then in the summer of 2002 Machinima.com announced 
um, submissions for this first film festival, which was going to be hosted in their hometown, which was Mesquite in Texas. And fake science was a result of this kind of three day weekend effort is what they described it as. Uh, they also said they um, developed it as a music video. Um, and they said it took every bit of their creative and technical muscle to make it. It's everything mm. they knew in order to, to create it, which I think is amazing. Yeah. Um, he said, uh, Brian said that the uh, fake science is, is one of the defining moments of his, his career, really. Provided him with the confidence um, of, of knowing that their creativity, his and, his and Mike's creativity, um, could have valid outlets. And as I said, this was pre-YouTube years. Um, they, uh, they, they, they were involved with, with Machinima, they were involved with the community, they were involved with the festival activities, and they said that allowed them to network with the community, bearing in mind just who I've just said was active in that community at the same time, you know, the, the games devs themselves, uh, NVIDIA, Unreal and what have you, Epic and what have you. Um, and Brian was particularly proud of being able to follow follow it up the, the, the film up a couple of years in a row with teaching young people at some summer tech computer camps in New York, um, which he said enabled him, he felt, to philosophically pass the torch to the next generation of machinimators. Oh, that's great. Which was which is a lovely thing to have said. Mm -hmm. um, and then he said that those first five years. Um, of of machinima.com were actually what helped him forge his career path. Um, it allowed them to explore their real careers within game development. Um, for a time, he and Mike were able to work side by side as, as pros. They created in-game cinematics for PC MMO Star Wars The Old Republic in 2010 and 2011, or, or between that period. And then in 2013, Brian did similar work for the action game Defiance. Um, which came out on PS3, Xbox 360, and the PC. And then Mike uh, went to work with Rooster Teeth um, while Brian continued to make games as uh, as a part-time indie developer with his uh, studio called Steamburger. And as things stand <laughs> right now, he's still working on his first indie game called Gone Camping. It's still not released. I had a look on Steam earlier today. It's still not out there. Um, Mike, in the meantime, worked on Ruby at Rooster Teeth between 2017 and 2020. So both have gone on to do some really interesting things, I think. And then interestingly, he says, in, um, of those early days in Machinima, Brian, um, Brian basically says that he felt that the work that they did um, was something that average people won't remember. He said he won't, they won't remember the wins, the losses, the internal dramas, um, and the achievements of the machinima community. What they'll remember is what they saw on the screen. Um, and then he says uh, examples of the of those struggles were quad god, hardly working, blood spell, mail room, um, mail restroom etiquette film, and mm. and many others are are films that he holds up um, as particularly memorable for the for the struggles from those early days. Um, and he says it was long before all the memes, all the viral stuff, all the streaming video, and that its impact uh, has been absolutely colossal. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't basically agree with him more, really. The film, this film was uploaded to the archive in 2004 by somebody called GDB. I don't know who that is, but they, he uploaded loads of films from those early days, including Quad God and Bloodspell and what have you. Um, and he was very active on the archive between 96 and 2005. And I don't know exactly when the how, how they got game uh, initiative actually started at, at, um, with Henry. 2004 was when the archive was created. So somebody was active long before that on the archive then. And mm -hmm. maybe they were just pulling it together. I don't know. But it's quite interesting that there, there was an effort to keep the content there long before we recognised it as, as being right. a thing. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that's all I'll, I'll, I'll say about it. But it's really interesting to have had 
the chance to speak to to Brian about it and you know how how they came to develop it and some of the things that were going on around it at the same kind of time because that's what puts it into context and when we're looking at things like you know how epics unreal is developed today uh, from that matinee tool uh, and you know the likes of what nvidia are up to and how they were inspired by the machinima community uh, in the development of their technology i think it's really it's you know it's one of those kind of groundbreaking films that was absolutely part of the original story of machinima yeah. It's a great pick. It's a great pick. Oh man, I'm so glad you had all that background information. I knew you I didn't know idea you had that interview in there. That's marvelous. Um and I didn't realize I, I know it was impactful, but I didn't realize it was that impactful, especially on the filmmakers themselves. That's just marvelous. Uh before we close, I wanted to mention that one of the advantages of the uh Machinima collection, they got game project, is that it's fully searchable with keywords. So if you're looking for a particular film, you can just pop it in or see where they have it. You can also check by year. So if you want to go back and look at clusters of things that happened in 2005, you can click 2005 and all the films will come up and all of the films are downloadable. So you can download them. Now the quality for some of the older ones is not really high. This fake scientist was okay Fake science was okay quality. Um, it might be a project for you, Phil, to upscale that. That would be an interesting thing to do. But Brian, anyway, the Brian's actually got it on his channel. Um, so there is. I've got a YouTube link that I can share as well. It's a, oh good. It's a little bit better than the um, Internet Archive version, but it's still twelve year old or, or so. Right, right. Um, but but there's a lot. We'll make sure we have a link to it. I urge anybody listening who is interested in Machinima to go and check this. It's the best and largest archive in the on the internet. 2,787 films from 1996 to 2023. So with that, uh, we'll close this particular episode. Um, thank you all for your comments. I, I always enjoy talking to you. We'll have links and commentary at... Uh, What's the name of our website? I forget. <laughs> I'm sorry. Completely machinima.com. Good Lord. I, the, the, the senility is happening early. <laughs> Completely machinima.com. Also, if you have comments or you want to share something, a uh, talk at completely machinima.com is the email address you want to go to. So thank you guys. And we'll see you next week for Tracy's pick. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.